Hi guys, welcome to the second part of my uh, channel's videos where I'm reviewing all the films that I'm collecting, talking to you about some of the key films from my DVD and Blu-ray library, and also keeping you updated with some of the new stuff that I'm buying. Um, this is the second part to my first initial video um, where I explained what I was going to do here is talk to you about five of the DVDs that I've recently watched. Now I've been buying a lot more Blu-rays and DVDs recently. I've collected DVDs for a long, long time, but I'm now sort of easing back on that and getting Blu-rays a lot more. It's a little bit more expensive, so I'm not buying in the huge quantities that I was before when I was getting DVDs, but I'm still buying the odd DVD now and then. If it's a film that I'm not particularly fussed about or not so sure how it's going to look on Blu-ray, if it's something I really want to get on Blu-ray. Um, but these ones I'm about to show you now are some of the five that I've recently seen. So I'm going to get straight into it. Uh, the first film, now this is not on the 1001 film list, See Before You Die, this is just something that I've really wanted to see for a long time. And it's called uh, Troll Hunter. Now, Troll Hunter, I first found out about it last year at uh, Fright Fest back in August. I went to Fright Fest where I saw about 10 of the films um, that were showing at the time. And Troll Hunter was one of the ones I was really, really excited about. And I was out there with my mate. And unfortunately, we had done an all-nighter through London. We'd seen something the night before, something god-awful. It was something really, really bad. And Troll Hunter was showing first thing the following morning, and we decided instead of going back home and coming back where we'd get about three hours sleep, let's just stay up in London all the way through the night and go and see Troll, Troll Hunter in the morning. But uh, it didn't work out that way. It got to about six o'clock, and we were just exhausted, so we decided to rule it out. Um, but we were kicking ourselves because we heard a lot of good things about it. Basically, Troll Hunter is a Norwegian film shot very much in the style of amateur footage, you know, like Blair Witch. Paranormal activity, that sort of thing. Um, now, what it's about, a, a documentary crew from a film school, three Norwegian students, are setting out to make a documentary about a rogue bear hunter, someone who's infamous across Norway um, for these killings of bears. And he's got quite a reputation in the bear community because they don't understand how some of the bears that he kills even get into Norway. and They don't know very much about him either. So they start doing this documentary on him. And um, it's done very, very well. It's very much a case of um, following along a standard storyline at first of this investigative, reportive nature. Um, so it takes about 15, 20 minutes before they track the, tro the troll hunter down. Um, and it is when they track him down and follow him out on his first kill, first snaring, that they discover that he's not killing bears at all. He's killing trolls, obviously enough. Now, when I first saw the trailer for this, I thought it was going to be a little bit more comedic, a little bit funny. But there's very little humour in it. It actually takes the subject matter of trolls, that legend and that folklore from Norway of having trolls, and makes it something that's real, make, makes it a standard thing that becomes accepted very, very quickly by the three documentary makers. They discover that there are trolls in the Norwegian countryside, out in the mountains, out in the forests, of varying sizes. You've got like your, your bridge trolls, your tiny trolls under bridges, you've got your three-headed Tr trolls that are tall as trees and then you've got like these behemoth trolls which are just absolutely epic and cause devastation all over the place and the film progresses with them following this troll hunter around as he goes about trying to capture this one I can't remember what they call it it's got a really weird name but there's apparently one troll that could potentially have a disease and the disease is making him quite crazy and, and he's striking out and causing a lot of disruption now it is cool because what you get is you get a documentary style film about trolls, whereby you're seeing the trolls regularly. Unlike monsters, which I reviewed earlier, monsters where you don't see much of the monsters at all. In Troll Hunter, you do see quite a bit of the trolls, and they're all very, very good. They all they all look really interesting. They're really well done, but they are quite obviously CGI, and I'm not a big fan of that at all. Um, and it does, on that level, break a little bit of the believability. But if you're watching a film about trolls and a troll hunter, you need to suspend disbelief. And you also need to be a fan of horror films. Even though this isn't particularly particularly scary, it has its scary moments, it's more, it's interesting. And it's also got something to say about the politics in Norway, which I won't give too much about, because there's a scene right at the end of the film which uh, really drives that home. But all in all, the film is enjoyable. You can watch it and have that sort of fun sense of suspense. It's not boring, it's not um, going through the motions of a typical horror film, it's quite interesting because you know that they're always going to see trolls and they're not just presented as these monstrous things all the time. So it's quite interesting, it almost feels at times like you are watching a documentary, it's that, it's that well done, a documentary about trolls. 
The casting was brilliant for the troll hunter himself. He was brilliant. Obviously, I haven't seen any of these guys in anything before um, because there is, it's a Norwegian cast and I haven't seen many Nor Norwegian films at all. I think maybe one other, uh, Dead Snow, or well, that may not even be Nor Norwegian, that might be Danish. Um, but my verdict on it is check it out. It's great fun. It is good fun. Um, it's not, hasn't got too much to it, so it's something quite lighthearted, but at the same time, don't put it on just for entertainment's sake because it's not it's not something that's action packed and it's not particularly hugely funny and hugely entertaining all the way through. In terms of a star rating for it, I'm going to give it a seven out of ten because um, it is very well done. In terms of a documentary film and amateur footage film, Blair, which obviously was the archetype for it and did it much better because it was the original as well um, and it was a lot more believable. This at times feels a little bit like there's some acting going on, which shouldn't really happen in an amateur footage film, particularly a horror one. Um, but it is interesting, it's unique, it's original, and the, the, one of the slogans for the film are that the most important film of our time is Norwegian. I wouldn't go that far, but I would certainly say that one of the most significant films of the last five years is Norwegian. It was a good film, 7 out of 10. If you like it, or if you want to think of other films that are like it, check out Dead Snow, which as I say, I think it's Norwegian, and it's about a group of students who go out to this cabin out in the mountains, and... Um, they steal a gold coin, they end up resurrecting Nazi zombies. Um, and it is great fun, and actually it's better than Troll Hunter. I'd give Dead Snow possibly 7 out of 10 as well actually, but it's better than, than Troll Hunter in my opinion. Um, so anyway, that was that's Troll Hunter. Um, next on my list, now this is something that I had wanted to see for a while, but I wasn't overly fussed about it, and it's Scream 4. Now, I was a big fan of the whole Scream series. Um, I didn't like two so much. Um, I know that's a bit controversial because people seem to like one and then they like two a little less and then three even less so. But I actually quite enjoyed three. Um, and I grew up with it as well. I was at school when I was a kid and a teenager at the time when Scream first came out. So I was part of that generation who were growing up with Scream. And at the time, obviously, Scream was a brilliant film in its way where it was so self-referential about other horror films laying down laws and everything. And it was actually scary, the first Scream as well. Um, Scream 4 I went into with a bit of caution because I didn't know how it was going to play out at all. I knew that they got all the cast back. They got Neve Campbell, they got Courtney Cox and they got David Arquette back, which I thought was pretty special, but they come back for all the films anyway. But because there had been such a significant gap between 3 and 4, I think it was like 8 or 9 years, maybe even 10 years, I thought this might be something different. So I started watching it. And it opens up very, very weirdly because the film opens up four times because you think you're watching the beginning of Scream and then it Scream Four, sorry, and then it turns out to be the opening minutes of Stab Three, and then you think you're watching Scream Four, and then it turns out to be the opening minutes of Stab Two, and so on like that until it gets a bit repetitive actually. But then it kicks in, and overall the film is pretty, pretty good. It does follow quite closely to the original Scream because it's back in Woodsboro. It's quite a similar dynamic to it. The characters are fairly interesting. At, on paper, they look a bit like vapid and vacuous, but they are quite interesting. Um, the killer, though, or I, I'm not giving anything away by saying that because there could be one killer, there could be two killers. Let's just say a killer in the film I did kind of suspect for a while, and that is because I, it had been leaked on the internet and I caught sight of it, which, which is something that I wish I hadn't. I found out about, like I found out that Bruce Willis was a ghost in Sixth Sense before I'd even seen it as well, which sucks. But anyway, the film was enjoyable. Um, it's got the heart of the original Scream, but it's also got this new flavour for this new millennium. And the thing is, the thing that I don't like about it is that it's, it, through no fault of its own, it's catering to the new generation. So the kids that are now 10 years younger than me. So the kids who are now the age that I was when I first watched Scream. Um, so it's kind of pandering to them a bit more. And the, the, the whole reinventing horror and being so self-referential about it all is getting a little bit cliched and old now and tired um, and it doesn't hold the same significance it did way back then but it's still a good film it's not great um, it's probably better than two but in my opinion not better than one or three so I'm going to give that a six out of ten um, because I did enjoy it I probably would watch it again some point in the future I'm not going to rush to watch it again though if you like it um, or if you want other films that are like it, you want to check out all your standard teen slash affair, in my opinion. You want to go for something a bit classier than Urban Legend, so you want to go with something maybe like, I, I know what you did last summer, or in fact, go back and watch the original Scream again. Although there is another film, actually, which I caught when I was in Canada a couple of years back, 
um, which was Wes Craven's film, and I can't remember what it's called. It was a Wes Craven film that came out about two years ago. I'll put it in the uh, text box below here because I've forgotten what it is at the moment. Um, but it was about a high school teen who goes a bit weird, and it's all, there's all slasher elements to it, and also monstrous elements to it. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd recommend that. Um, moving on from those two, two horror fixes to something a bit different. This one is called 44 inch chest. Now this is what on paper it appears to be your standard British gangster flick starring Ray Winstone et al. You've got um, John Hurt in it, you've got Ian McShane, um, you've got quite a good British gangster cast you would think when you put them all together and that's certainly the way it was marketed. It was marketed as a bit of a flash gangster film and I saw it marketed that way as well but I was also intrigued by the plot. Now the plot is Ray Winstone plays a man or sort of butch East End gangster type man whose wife has left him and he's absolutely heartbroken. He's a shell of a man. He's like, he's he's turned into a pussy basically. He's, he's no longer got his manhood and his masculinity that he's so renowned for. So he calls all his mates up and gets, gets them all around and you think that what's going to be happening is they're going to go and get the guy who is sleeping with his wife and they're going to kill him. And that's set up within the first five or ten minutes and basically they kidnap the guy who was a waiter who's been sleeping with his wife and bring him to this it's like some abandoned house and they've got him locked up in this this cupboard really and for the first 20 minutes 30 minutes after that Ray Winstone is just shattered he can barely say anything he's so distraught and all his mates around him are like running around him some of them are being abusive John Hurt plays one of the most psychotically fucked up characters I've ever seen in terms of the, some of the stuff that he says he's so foul mouthed and you don't really expect it from John Hurt, the old elephant man, but he pulls it out of the bag. A lot of people that um, I've talked to about it have said that they don't buy John Hurt in it, that they don't like the way that he acted in it. I thought he was brilliant personally. And for me, every actor in it represents some aspect of masculinity. You've got the John Hurt character who is this older, sardonic bastard, really. You've got Ian McShane who is this smooth, cool, gay gangster type character. Um, you've got uh, like a mummy's boy who still lives at home with his mum and he's about 50 years old and he's a bit soft soft and then you've got the young psychotic gangster type character. But they can all be seen as facets of Winstone's uh, mind really because that's how it plays out when you see them all rallying around him in the room. But um, it is not a gangster film. If you watch this because you're expecting a gangster film, do not. Get something else. Get Lockstock or something else because this is a British gritty drama. It is very heavily dialogue driven and very well written as well. Apparently when they were rehearsing the film, rather than go on sets, they went on to a stage and they did numerous, numerous takes as if it was going to be played out in a theatre. And I think it's perfect for theatre. It would work in theatre really, really well. And it is so engrossing in that way because it's so intimate with these five characters. You're just drawn into their world. You're drawn into what they're saying. I loved it. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. It's got one of the best and filthiest lines I've ever heard in film before, um, which is you cunting spunker, which is the best insult I've ever heard in film. And the way it's spat out is brilliant. I've had it in my head for a while. Um, it is a good film. It's a great film. If you like a bit of a tough nut British drama, check this out. And it, for anyone who has ever felt betrayed before or something like that, I'm sure you'll appreciate it. I'm sure you'll like it. It has a lot of heart. And my personal favourite scene is when Ray Winstone is face to face with the guy who's sleeping with his wife and he talks about how much he loves his wife. And he doesn't do it in an over, overly cliched way. This ain't no four weddings and a funeral. This is 44 inch chest. Um, recommendations, sorry, for that one would be um, in terms of a British, gritty British drama for that. I reckon check out something like Kill List, one of the films that came out last year. Um, or check out um, Tyrannosaur, actually, um, which was another absolutely brilliant and mind-blowing British drama. Um, Tyrannosaur better than 44 Inch Chest in my opinion. But go and check those out if you like the 44 Inch Chest. Right, next on the list is The Beaver. Now I was interested in this one for a while because I followed Mel Gibson's breakdown and meltdown in the media as I'm sure many of you did as well when it was happening a few years back and I heard all the tapes of him insulting his wife and um, I felt a bit sorry for him, although he came across as an absolute lunatic. I felt sorry for him because he's clearly mentally not all there and he is not getting the help that he needs. Um, but I always knew that Jodie Foster, who's the director of this film, had this film lined up in reserve for him and was, he was always going to star in it. And she was there for him throughout that whole debacle. Like I'm not defending the guy, he's a bastard, but I think that he's not as he's being portrayed totally by the media. 
Now, this film, funnily enough, is about a guy who is suffering from depression. His wife has kicked him out. His kids don't respect him. He is dissatisfied with his life. Mel Gibson kind of plays Mel Gibson in that respect. Until one day he finds this beaver, this hand puppet beaver, um, and he puts it on and it begins talking for him. And Mel Gibson doesn't talk as himself anymore. He talks as the beaver, who is this cockney, cockney voiced character. And it actually has a nice bit of heart and it's not a comedy. Like it's, a, it's, an, it's an indie, it's an indie dark comedy, but I wouldn't say it's a, a comedy really at all. And it was marketed that way. And basically he goes about trying to get his life back through the use of this puppet, just talking through this puppet. He's unable to talk himself at all. Now, Jodie Foster plays his wife. She does that very well. She directs it very well. And the story overall is pretty good. Even the relationship between the two younger characters in the, f in, in the film, uh, Mel Gibson's son and this girl, um, it, that plays out really well. And I actually really like the dynamic and the romance there because a lot of the time it's a bit of bullshit that's tacked on and you don't buy into it at all. But I did buy into it. And it, had a great, it has a great line in it uh, between the two of them when they're standing in front of this graffitied wall as well, which when you see it, I won't spoil it for you, but you'll see for yourself. Um, and it has quite a surprising ending as well. The last 10, 15 minutes really shook things up for me for the film. Um, and it's funny because I saw this film about three or four days after I saw Take Shelter, or maybe it was the next day after I saw Take Shelter. And I realised, man, this is not a film about a guy with depression. This is a guy who's mentally ill. He's mentally ill. And... Um, it's not being recognised by the people around him and he's not getting the help he needs. And I found that quite poignant because that's almost Mel Gibson's life at this point as well. And I wonder if that's why he did it. Um, good film. Really good film. I enjoyed it. Um, I would rewatch it as well. But it's not absolutely fantastic because it lacks the punch. It lacks the real, real heart, the real core, the real emotions there. It's all a bit glazed and glossed over a little bit. Um, it's a little bit too twee, if you want to call it that. Um, so uh, by way of a rating, I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10. I did enjoy it though. If you want to see something like it, I would suggest checking out uh, Lars and the Real Girl. Um, or ch ch just check out so the type of film where somebody ha is in a desperate point in their life and does something quite outlandish to shake it up or to bring, them, bring themselves back from depression. Uh, pick any number of films for that if you want. Um, right, now the final film, and I'm glad that this one's going to be quicker than the other video because I don't want to make them all rambling on, is called Mirror Mask. Now, I wanted to put this one to you guys now because I'm going to be handing this back because this is not actually from my collection. It's something that a friend of mine lent to me. Um, it's a Neil Gaiman story about a young girl who lives in a travelling circus troupe and her mother gets very ill. She goes into hospital and then this girl goes on this bizarre, fantastical journey into her own own mind in many ways, I, I suppose, um, to try and connect and try and find out what it is that makes her so sad about why her mother's in, in hospital, some personal responsibility. And if you're a Neil Gaiman fan, you'll love it because there, there's so, so many fantastic visuals in the film. The sound is absolutely amazing. The acting is really good. Um, you really care about the girl in it as well. She's a really good actress, good up and coming actress to watch out for. Um, I really enjoyed it. It's hard to explain exactly what happened in it because it's so fantastical. It's kind of like Time Bandits or it's kind of like Brazil, but for a younger audience. I mean, this is a PG, but it, it, it's, it's a brilliant film. It's an enjoy, enjoyable film. Um, not particularly for me for re, for, for rewatching because there's so many different elements in it and I'm not massively into fantasy, not massively into fantasy. But if you are into it, check it out. It's even one that's safe for the kids as well. So you watch it with kids as well, no problem. Um, yeah, as by way of recommendation, as I say, Time Bandits Brazil, any sort of Terry Gilliam film. If you like those, you'll like this. So check it out. Um, cheers, guys. That's it for now. Um, I'll be back soon with another video with the latest Blu-rays that I've watched recently. But thanks for watching. Any comments, put them down below. Cheers. Thank you.